Hello and welcome back. Today we will start Unit 2 on Filters, Lecture 8-1, Introduction to Filters. The objectives for today's lecture are to define the various types of filters and to summarize filter specifications. There are two applications of Fourier transforms, filters and sampling. Filters will be Unit 2 in this course and sampling will be Unit 3. Theory. A filter is a circuit with one input and one output. It is used to attenuate or amplify frequencies within a given range. We can identify five popular types of filters based upon their intended frequency response. The following table provides an example of each. The first one is a low pass filter. A low pass filter has values at low frequencies and it attenuates at high frequencies. So it has the following shape, where this would be the magnitude of h of j omega, and this is the frequency at zero, and the frequency as it gets larger. The second one is a high pass filter, which attenuates frequencies at low frequencies. So it would have the following shape, where that's zero and omega. The next one is a band pass filter, which only passes frequencies in a certain band. So it would have the following shape. The next one is a band stop or a notch filter. And it passes frequencies outside of a certain band. So it looks like this. And the last one is an all-pass filter. And as you can imagine, it passes all frequencies. So then the question becomes, well, what's the benefit of that? Well, sometimes when you have an active filter that's an all-pass filter, one that has an op-amp, the benefit in it is that it has a high input impedance and it operates as a buffer. There's also one other benefit for an all-pass filter, but it has to do with not the magnitude of it, but the phase. So if we superimpose the phase on top of this all-pass filter, we'll see that the phase looks like the following. Because sometimes what you want a filter to do is to change the phase performance. Low-pass filter. The following figure is an ideal low-pass filter. Unfortunately, we cannot build ideal filters in practice using components such as resistors, inductors, capacitors, and op-amps. You actually examine these types of filters in ECE 205, the prerequisite for this course. But notice for an ideal low-pass filter, it looks like a, a brick wall. It has a magnitude h of j omega where the gain is k, the cutoff frequency or bandwidth is b, and it has a pass band and a stop band. In reality, an actual filter has to have a gradual transition as I showed in the prior sketches. It cannot just simply turn on or off. The transfer function and frequency response for this circuit would be h of j omega is equal to k rect of omega over 2b. If I find the inverse Fourier transform of k rect of omega over 2b, I will have kb over pi sink of bt over pi. So what this tells me is that in the time domain, this would look like a sink function, where the magnitude is kb over pi at zero, and the cross zero crossings are at pi over b, two pi over b, etc. This response has infinite length in both directions because it's a sink function. It has a slow decay and it's non-causal. It's not causal because h of t is not equal to zero for t less than zero, which means that in the real world, there would be no way in order to generate that sink function, which means you couldn't get that ideal low pass filter in the frequency domain. So one thing we can do to try to account for the non-causality is to introduce a delay h of t equals kb over pi sink of b times t minus t naught over pi, which is shown in the following figure. So notice that it still has a slow decay time, but it now starts at t naught instead of at zero. So in theory, depending upon the delay, you could now say it 
approximates a causal system. Since the sink decays in time by 1 over t, which is slow, you will need a large delay. The greater the delay, the better the approximation. We can truncate the tail to give an approximation ideal filter that is causal, and we can truncate at the positive end in order to solve the problem of the infinite length. In the frequency domain, this delay appears as a linear phase shift in frequency, and the slope corresponds to a delay of t naught seconds. The frequency response is now given by the following equation. H of j omega is equal to k rect of omega over 2b e to the negative j omega t naught. And here is a plot of the phase angle h of j omega with a slope of negative omega t naught. The delay will be present in practical filters. A more nearly ideal filter will have a greater delay. However, it is difficult to control both the magnitude and phase responses. If the delay is small, then there will be a distortion in the frequency domain because it'll be a convolution of a sink with the ideal low pass filter. And what you would see is something like this. Band pass filter. An ideal band pass filter has the following frequency response. So here's H of J omega. And here are your two pass bands. This is omega, where the center frequencies are omega naught, negative omega naught. And here is your low frequency and your high frequency. It has a gain of K. And we call the maximum the pass band. And where it's minimum, we call this the stop band. So the gain is K, the upper cutoff frequency is omega H, the lower cutoff frequency is omega L, the bandwidth is omega H minus omega L, and the resonant frequency would be the geometric mean of the frequencies, cutoff frequencies, which is omega L times omega H. In practice, because now we know we cannot have an ideal bandpass filter, we must allow the non-sharp roll-off at the cutoff frequency as shown in the following figure. So here is an example of that non-sharp roll-off for a low-pass filter. So first we draw our axes. Here's omega, and here's the magnitude of h of j omega. And now instead of sharply dying off, we see that there's a gradual roll off like this, where this area here is our pass band. And we now have an area where the roll off happens that we call our transition band. There's one on both sides. And then the area beyond that transition band on both sides is our stop band. And then here we have our frequency at zero. However, the question becomes, when you have this ideal low-pass filter, what is the bandwidth? Where is the cutoff frequency? So this is where engineers typically use that lower, where it drops by 3 dB in order to define the cutoff frequency or the bandwidth. The half power point, or where it drops by 3 decibels, or where in absolute terms, the maximum is reduced by 30%. There may also be ripples in the pass band and or stop band as shown by the following figure. So once again, here are our axes. This is omega and the magnitude of H of J omega. And now we see that we have a pass band that has ripples that then dies off with a gradual transition to the stop band that has ripples. 
So once again, this area here would be our transition. This area at the top is our pass band. And here is our stop band. And there's one on both sides. We typically plot the magnitude of the filter frequency response on the dB scale. This would be like the Bode plot you did in your prior course. Many times we only plot the positive frequency ranges with the understanding that any real system will have even symmetry with respect to the magnitude. So if I was going to plot, plot this in decibels, it would look like the following. My vertical axis is now 10 log base 10, the magnitude of H of J omega squared, this could also be written as 20 log base 10 of H of J omega, which is what you probably saw in your prior course. And I'm going to do one sided. So I'll have here. And here's omega. And a lot of times this is plotted on a semi log plot. So here's the ripples again. There's your transition. And there's your stop band. So this would be the pass band. This would be the transition band. And here would be the stop band.